Thanks so much for having me and giving the opportunity to talk about what I call my circle of friends in electronic music. I uh, am old enough to have kind of been around electronic music very early in its history in the United States. Of course, it goes back to the beginning of the to early 20th century, but there was a big revival when Donald Buchla, who unfortunately just passed away a few a couple of weeks ago, and Robert Moog each invented the uh, voltage control uh, synthesizer in the uh, 1960s. Uh, I think it was new in around 1965 when I first ran into one of Don's Buchla boxes. Uh, they were, he had a brief uh, touch with the commercial world in the sense that the Buchla box was taken on by uh, CBS. And then when they decided not to continue, because it wasn't, didn't turn out to be a pop instrument, uh, they took his name. And he had to put out uh, the Buchla 600, but it, he couldn't call it a Buchla box anymore, which was, which was his idea for the name of it. But it was a multi-module, uh, uh, synthesizer. What was particularly interesting about it um, is that it was not keyboard based. So unlike the Moog synthesizer, which had a big life in popular music, Don's synthesizer helped develop electronic music uh, that was not based on necessarily melodic themes or harmony, melody, and rhythm, but sound, kind of ushering in the whole sound world and a lot of the way things that people do in even instrumental writing. I like to think of a lot of contemporary music as having been really influenced by the development of this kind of electronic music. Now in 1965, I was at, uh, in Palo Alto at Stanford University studying linguistics. But I had a little assist assistantship job in a, a place where they were doing, helping with, you know, you don't have to be an expert on the things you do for those jobs. I was helping with a computer-assisted language program in Russian. It meant that I did errands for them. I didn't know anything about Russian or computers and didn't have to to do my job. But the people in the same hall were graduate students in mathematical psychology who were using computers in really inventive ways to find out, to study perception. And one of them was a man named David Wessel, who's the first of these composers that I'm going to talk about. David and I met, I used to go and sit and listen to the common room hall there as they uh, were talking about their ideas because I found them so fascinating. And then I heard David talking about jazz. He was a former jazz drummer. He'd been a bebop drummer through high school and college. And uh, I think it was Miles Davis was playing that week, that week in San Francisco. So we said, let's go together. And then we started a, an improvising group of, with a friend of his was a flute player and, and myself and him on the drums. And we were communicating with friends in Chicago. He was originally from, went to school there. Uh, uh, and these people were doing free improvisation. The idea was free, no pre-existing melodic material or harmonic material to work from, but to listen to each other and figure out ways of interacting that could you know, make sense or be something that you wanted to experience listening to. And we were sending back, to show you the primitive technology, we were sending back and forth reel-to-reel -reel tapes that we were making and then, then, uh, then cassette tapes came and we used those. But it was very awkward, but we really were, you know, excited about this. And David was very interested in live. Uh, he went from drums very quickly to 
live electronic music and computer music. And I really was get, getting in on the very ground floor of that the center at Stanford that John Chowning started. He would go up there and work with them. And uh, we started a large improvisation ensemble. And then uh, the years went by, and he graduated, and he ended up moving to Michigan State University, where he set up a psychoacoustics laboratory, which was actually a computer music studio and in, in disguise, because there was no money for computer music. And then he had the first music measurement conference. The biggest part of his budget was telephone calls, and he, he called different people who were well-known. When one of them finally said yes, he'd call the other ones and say, so-and-so and so-and-so are coming. And eventually, Pierre Boulez agreed to come. It was so, so fantastic. So he did the, this event. And of course, who was Boulez seeing running this show and the person who's most prominent? So when he started, got ready to build IRCOM, David was one of the people he hired to help build the Institut pour Recherche et Communication Acoustique Musique, which is right underground next to the Centre Pompidou. And at that time, computer music meant spending a month building one sound. And David immediately became motivated with the idea of developing live performance instruments for the computer. And eventually, he became the head of pedagogy for IRCOM. And he also started a project, which was the project that developed Max. Miller Puckett wrote the code, but David ran that, that program. It was his idea, how to, you know, the vision for doing it. And then he was hired away from uh, IRCOM after living in Paris, the lucky guy, for uh, 15 years. He uh, was hired away from them by the University of California at Berkeley, and he established uh, CINMAT, the Center for New Music and Audio Technology. And one of the projects he developed there got back to that Buchla synthesizer I was talking about. Don's synthesizer, he lived in Berkeley and I knew him very well, uh, didn't use keyboard, it used a fretted keyboard configuration where, there was, where the, the things you would press were touch sensitive and, and sensitive to where you were along the key and how fast you would, and you could put different musical parameters on these keys. So you could really program a very complicated way, thing that you could play. Most people used it though to program those complicated things and then make a recording because it was still difficult to really control a large number of things in real time. David, using Max, came up with a, and, and, a, and using an alternate controller that, stay on, that uh, uh, Don developed called Thunder. Some of you may know it, it's a very old instrument by now, but it sits under the hand and every finger is over some one of those it's a hand shaped set of keys, and then there's a, a, a not keys, I mean these touch sensitive things, but in the shape of a key. And then on the top, there's things where you can choose, reconfigure what the different gestures might do. And he wanted to use the computer as a compositional aid. So the first thing he did was play for himself, have the computer play for him every possible four note combination of melody, so he could pick his three favorites to use as the material for the piece. And it's not surprising, since he was a jazz drummer to begin with, they were them all in one, four, and five, like he was playing a blues. And he wanted, he was so excited because he could, sh he could show me where he was on the screen. I said, David, I can hear where you are. I don't need to look at a screen to know what chord he's ringing. Besides, I wasn't interested necessarily in always being in the same chordal level as he was. I wanted to learn to improvise freely with all those notes in each of their three uh, tonalities. And that took more time than uh, you know, learning a difficult score. But we got it together, and uh, there was a festival at the main concert hall there at UC Berkeley, and we recorded live this performance of this piece. He, he called it Situations One, I guess, because he was setting up a situation. And 
any patterns that you're hearing are being made by the computer. He's not a keyboard player. He's not playing notes. The next person whose work I want to describe a little bit and play a little example from is uh, sad. You know, you get to be my age and half the people you talk about are no longer with us. Uh, Robert Ashley passed away a couple of years ago, but for 35 years I toured with him in his opera company, uh, beginning with his opera Atalanta, and then he wrote me a originally a performance piece that was not in an opera, and then that expanded into an opera. It was originally called My Brother Called, and it's a kind of a international spy story of sorts. Uh, it begins long after I thought they had forgotten My Brother Called. Please go to the cafe across the street from the apartment. Wait there for a phone call. The code will be on the menu that the waiter brings, it goes on. Uh, it's uh, one of the great things about Bob Ashley is that when he writes you a piece, he tailor makes it for you. He really listens and knows your best qualities and the things you can do. And in this piece, he has written some beautiful melismatic lines to introduce each of the sentences in, this, in the story. And then after that, when you get to the actual words, you are to spontaneously invent. He calls it spontaneous musical invention, melodic material based on the declamation of the text. I want to give you an example that's not from the, one I'm, the opera I'm going to play because it really explains it clearly how it works. My first opportunity to work with Bob it's ironic, we had both been in the Bay Area for the same period of time, for about 10 of the years I was there, he was there, but he was at Mills College where he uh, established their Center for Contemporary Music, the program. Many of the people I know who were composers who went for their masters at Mills said it was the most influential thing on their in their development. And uh, Bob set that up and, and uh, gave it its character, which it still has today. Uh, again, really working on the individual qualities and interests of the students rather than so much a, uh, after all, this is graduate school, not so much a rudiments type thing, but really finding your way, your own voice. Um, so I'd run a contemporary music ensemble for 10 years. I co-directed it with a wonderful composer and conductor named Robert Hughes. And during that 10 years, we were able to raise the money to support a 23-piece ensemble on the Domain Musical model that Boulez had in the 50s. So it was one of every instrument in the orchestra and a uh, uh, pianist and a couple of percussionists, and we had Don Buchla on electronics. And we finally got a grant from the NEA, a, a consortium grant and each group that was in this consortium was to choose a composer and then uh, all four groups would commit themselves to doing a performance of all four composers. Um, and we ended up picking Bob Ashley because as my friend Robert Hughes said, we felt he had the most original mind in contemporary music at that time because he had so many ideas. And he, he'd heard me enough that instead of writing a, an occasional piece for the event, he took an aria from his then opera, Atalanta, that he was working on and made a chamber orchestra arrangement for it. Uh, and little did I know, this was my audition. And I uh, moved back to New York, as he had just done during this process. My roommate at the time was a great drummer who had worked as a tumba player. Tumbas are congas that are larger than life, you, you stand to play them. And the man who played them, aptly named Big Black, who toured and played with Dizzy Gillespie for a long time and also did a lot of interesting work on his own, is a wonderful musician, doesn't read music. Bob, because he was writing a piece with text that he was not going to work with the other person on, but that I was going to have to work on my own. He wrote down in musical notation all the rhythms in the text, how he wanted them. 
and it came out. We find this case in connection with a single woman of high family, low taste. That shows something. Her grandmother disapproved. They always do. But that didn't stop her. The father's side of the family was said to be to blame. They were in architecture, which is evidently respectable, but artistic nevertheless. And it goes on in that thing. Well, I had memorized this I, because my friend Big Black memorized me doing it. He, and then we sang it, I sang it with him so it locked in. When I went to Bob's apart, studio to do it for him, he was so impressed because he'd been using students in his operas at Mills and he, nobody had taken the trouble to really dig down and get the thing right. So he came out to California for the performance and afterwards he said, I want you to perform in Rome with us in our uh, 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 premiere of this piece, Atlanta in uh, in a, in a big theater in Rome, and but I want to change the translate that text into Italian because there are some Italian, some other Italian parts in the opera. I have, have a couple of Italian actors working, one Italian actress actually working in it, and then there was also a stage director who was her husband. So, so the person who helped Bob Ashley. Uh, realized the electronic orchestra for that uh, is uh, Tom Hamilton. I want to give him credit. And if I get through the next piece soon enough, I'll play you some of his music as well. Um, when MIDI came along, Bob was already you know, well into his 50s, and he said to me, I'm too old to learn this new thing. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, well, you should meet my friend Tom Hamilton. He'll show you how. And, and it worked really well. And then Tom ended up helping him realize the, 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 the accompaniments and became the engineer for the group. Uh, you notice there's a lot of processing on the voices. Uh, and each voice is sometimes in a different space, like me and the woman who was singing. By the way, I misled you. In the piece as a whole, they're taunting me and questioning me. In that particular section, she's reciting one of the codes, which is, in this case, he took personal ads out of the New York Review of Books. Uh, uh, so they're all people's description, you know, uh, blonde, intelligent, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, so that, that's what, the, I didn't want to confuse you about that part. Uh, so Tom became a member of the band. In other words, we ended up with four singers, the composer who was also performing as a singer, and the sound man was live processing everything, closing, you know, tur ver so many things happening in some of these operas, multiple voices all happening at the same time, each in their own space. So he was like a musician in the band, and then we had, when on the road, we found a guy in Holland who was really good at setting up sound systems. He started having, we'd set up a new sound system every time we went out in each place we performed. And uh, so whether you liked his style or not, it always sounded perfect, which is a really nice, a nice thing, you know, because so many times you hear things that you have to make allowances for things that don't go well if you can actually control the whole thing. One of the reasons he chose this style of opera was that it was something that he could actually do and make it up to the standard that he wanted. Um, so I want to go on now to one of Bob Ashley's colleagues in a group that was really seminal in American electronic music and experimental music, the Sonic Arts Union which contained Robert Ashley, David Behrman, Gordon Muma, and Alvin Lussier, who is, whose work I'm going to perform now. It's a piece called Music for Baritone and Slow Sweep Pure Wave Oscillators. A very romantic title, don't you think? Uh, well, Alvin, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Because he, at the beginning of his career, he was a hotshot student composer who wrote in the style of Stravinsky. This would have been in the 50s. And uh, he won a prix to Rome and decided, it was two years, and decided on his way he would go early and 
go to Venice and, and go to San Marcos and see the beautiful cathedral there. And he had the idea in his mind that maybe he would want to compose something for that, for that space like Gabrielli did. And he walked into the cathedral and was suddenly totally overwhelmed with the idea. It was more than just an idea. He was just hit. This is not, I don't belong here. This is not my place. This music that I've been writing has nothing to do with me. What am I going to do? And he went to the Prix de Rome. He was there for two years. And he didn't write a note of music. He just thought and thought. And halfway through the, the, the time he was there, he got an a invitation from Brandeis University to be a tenure track professor. And he wrote back and said, of course I accept. But I have to tell you, I've changed. Well, he, of course, did a good, fine job. He went through his job of a new professor is to teach all the basic things and conduct the chorus and stuff. And he still hadn't written anything. He was still thinking about what to do. And at Brandeis, which is a very scientifically oriented school, some professors had been working on brain waves. And it was discovered that if you're in a beta state, the brain waves make a wave that's strong enough to actually make a signal that can can, can cause an instrument, like a percussion instrument, to play. And they he wanted him, they went to all the prominent professors there, and none of them were interested because they all had their own ideas, as Alan put it. And he said, I was in the perfect position to receive a new idea because I didn't have any ideas. So he started working on this. And what turns out to be the case, in order for your brain to produce the uh, uh, beta waves, I mean, the alpha waves, you have to be extremely calm. If you try to express anything, if you put any energy into your performance, the sound goes away. And that got him thinking of, of music outside his personal expression and his personal tastes and things, and dealing with phenomena of acoustics and of sound in space to make his pieces. So they're very exacting, very precise, there's no room for the slightest error. But they, in my opinion, turn out to be very often very spiritual and very uh, sort of almost transcendent. And I think of this piece as being in that category. Out of each of these speakers will come a sine wave. They begin on one pitch. It happens to be D. And one of them traverses the amount of the interval of a you know, glissing, glissing, glissandoing, the interval of a half step in X amount of time. Meanwhile, the other one is, go, is descending in X plus Y at such a rate that if the voice comes in and inter interrupts the glissing line with a straight tone, when at the time that the line has gotten up to E flat, and in one phrase it goes ooh, the second note will be right at the time that the other one has gone down its half step, and so that whole step will be in a unison with one with each of those tones. I find the thing absolutely magical, and I can perform it live for you. It'll take about thirteen minutes. A little anecdote about that piece. I sing at a festival on the coast of Oregon every summer, and uh, it's a fascinating classical festival, but people who also do workshops and uh, seminars in the afternoon. This was a seminar where I played a number, performed a number of contemporary pieces, including this piece. And there was an, uh, this is a festival that was founded by an African-American minister, and the design of it 50, 60 years ago 50 years ago, was to uh, help develop the uh, classical careers of minority classical performers. But he also took on the idea of having some contemporary music, and I became his sort of contemporary music singer. And so this older African-American woman was sitting in the back row of the concert, and she, after it was over, she came up to me and she said, when I came to that concert, I had a headache, and after hearing that piece, 
my headache was gone. <laughs> and so I, I, I said music can be healing. I was very pleased with that. I just love that piece of music. I think it's so interesting because we think of music as being harmony, melody, and rhythm, and a lot of the music we love is that. Here's a piece that is sounds very consonant, but except for split seconds when the pitches meet, it's always dissonant. So that what, you know, it's always, an, uh, there's always a, except for the moment they pass, they're, you know, microtones away from each other all the time. And yet when you hear those fifths or those octaves come in, they sound like the most in tune fifth or octave you ever heard in your life. And they're there for such a small amount of time that you can't, you know, they, they pass immediately into, into beating. Uh, I just love the idea of making music completely out of natural phenomenon, and then it turns out to sound as if it had a kind of a spiritual effect. Because as I believe, spirit is embodied. If there is a thing that we call spirit, it must come out of, it must be as real as a tree, and very much like a tree. Uh, uh, it's, uh, this is nature making something which affects us who are nature. It, it's your, our whole interdependence with everything that is, as the Mohawks would put it. And I just, this piece just, just never, never stops me from thinking about, you know, in a more philosophical way about life. Okay. This is a piece that I performed uh, at the uh, last two concerts that I did up here in Maine. Some of you were there. Um, it's by the wonderful human being and composer Phil Niblock, who is a very interesting example of how the new technologies, or how a person with no formal musical training whatsoever can look at sound in a unique way and figure out how to make his own kind of music. When Phil started in New York, he was a filmmaker. He made the best film I know about Sun Ra called The Rising Sun, which if you haven't seen it, it's a short film, it's unbelievable. He's a great photographer. He traveled with and photographed the Duke Ellington band, but he gradually, <laughs> gradually got more involved in the in sort of downtown scene and and he was, people asked him, he started making pieces by having a single instrument record specific tones, and he, had, he used an oscillator, he gave them specific uh, numbers of you know, beats, any specific oscillator tones to record long tones, and then he bunched them together, and the, with instruments, a very rich, environment of beating patterns and, and uh, uh, it's rather aggressive uh, uh, wall of sound um, and uh, he people asked him to some dancers asked him to make pieces for their dances and I guess because there's lots of internal rhythms in this and he didn't like the way the dancers were dancing to his music that he'd written for them. So he, I mean, did not just didn't like it, he wanted something else. And he started making films of people working, third world people working on repetitive tasks like untangling a net or building a boat or fishing in some way or pulling in you know, industrial fishermen, all kinds of different workers, along with a solid state sound uh, and he founded, he was part of a foundation called the Experimental Intermedia Foundation. So this is right up you guys alley. And uh, uh, founded a label for that foundation and has, has produced recordings of many, many uh, experimental musicians. And to make a living, he taught at Staten Island College, he taught photography. And when he got to retire, a long time ago now, probably 20 years ago, he decided that it was now time to get his music out there, and he's on the road eight months a year. He's now in his mid-80s. I think he just turned 83, actually, early 80s. And 
It's phenomenal. Well, I asked him if he would, he'd never done anything for voice. I said, would you make a piece for voice, for me? So he did the same method, but it changed when computers came in. Instead of recording each line and then you know, recording the pitch you want, he had me record just one pitch, A flat, with different formants, different overtones, different sounds, but always A flat. And then in his computer, he could microtune the, uh, uh, the pitches so as to control what more, what results he might get. But it turns out that the voice has a much simpler overtone structure than an instrument. And the result was so surprising. I mean, he knew what was happening when he was listening to it on the earphones, but when we, I met with him and he played me what we're about to hear, we were both so surprised at the result of doing it with a voice that we were like dancing around the room. It was a fantastic moment, I remember. And he does, he, it's often done with, with video, uh, but when, you, and I've often performed it in his evenings of his music where he'll have a long evening of these pictures of, of, of films of people working and different of his pieces will be played in it. This piece is 21 minutes long. And different, most of his pieces are around that level because, after all, an LP side was 20 to 22 minutes. And so, if you wanted your recording, a piece to be recorded, you know, before CDs came along, most pieces were in the neighborhood of around 20 minutes. <laughs> you get a grant for a recording, right? It had to fit on one side. Uh, but uh, he doesn't like the piece to be performed with the working people if it's just one piece. That's an extended evening length experience and the music comes in and out of it. So he made, he gave me a special video that he'd done which we performed with. I can't do the video for you. But this is, the piece is called As Yet Untitled. It exists, this was recorded on the Touch label from England in his first album of them. He's made many since then. Uh, and on the other side, the other, I did, there are two versions of this. As Yet Untitled and As Yet Untitled Live, which I'll play for you. In other words, if this piece were done live, I would be doing one of the parts. But my part was then recorded in a, in a live performance, uh, uh, actually in a live recording session, so it sounds better. But uh, I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, I get to, uh, I can only sing around A flat, but I can sing a little tiny bit microtone sharp or a little tiny bit, bit, bit flat. I can glide up into the pitch very slowly. I can uh, use all different formants in my mouth and I can do them at different speeds. I can, so I figured out a, a way of doing it and then I do it different every time. Uh, let's hear it. Let's see, I've got the volume right. Okay, let's just put this over. Maybe we should turn this down because we don't want the mic to pick up. Uh, uh, this might, might be bad or something. Uh, so, A, Y, U, live. Here we are. Get ready. Hmm. 